Well, this morning, I'd like for you to open with me in your Bibles to Psalms. Psalms chapter 29. I already read from this, but I'm going to read from it again because our, our message is continuing in stewardship over the past probably month and a half. We've been dealing with stewardship and how God wants us to use our finances and how he promises as we are faithful to him, he pours out blessings. How many of you know you can't outgive God? Amen. Amen. You just can't do it. And in his word, in Malachi, he even says, try me in this, test me in this, and see if I will not pour out a blessing upon you. I mean, when God gives you a dare, how many of you know you need to take it? Amen. He says, try me in this. Well, this morning, we're continuing on in this. But how many of you know that stewardship in God's eyes goes beyond finance? Stewardship in God's eyes goes beyond our finance. This morning, we're going to continue in our series in those areas of our life where God requires good stewardship. And this morning, we're going to continue with what we've been doing already. We're going to be talking about worship. And the question this morning is, so why do you worship? I want you to ask yourself that question. Love to praise the Lord. Love to praise the Lord. Why do you worship? What, what is the driving factor? I, 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 I was telling the, uh, when we got together for prayer this morning with some of the leadership, I, I told them I'm going to be using this illustration. They kind of liked it, so I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, but uh, down in Mississippi, when I was down in Hurley, Mississippi, you got to don't say Mississippi, Mississippi. And when we were down there in Hurley, Mississippi, I mean, we were just around the corner from Buzzard Bruce, Mississippi, just to give you a heads up. And we had some of the best people down there, and one, one of my favorite guys down there, Kelvin Dykes. Kelvin Dykes, he was a big fella. He was tall. He was just big. He was, he was, he, and, and he was a good old boy. And he used to talk. Even if he didn't have a toothpick in his mouth, he talked like he did. He talked like this. One day, his, his, his wife, Shari, Kelvin and Shari, and Shari Dykes, she said, Kelvin, why don't you tell me you love me anymore? And I remember Kelvin looked right at her and he said, darling, I told you when we married you, if I changed my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> And so often, that's kind of the way our worship is with God. We get saved, we get excited, we're worshiping Him, but then life goes on, and we decide, well, He knows. If I change my mind, I'll let Him know. But the Bible says in Psalms 29, verse 1, Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. And this morning as we look at this, verse 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. How many of you know... He paid debts for us that we could never pay. Amen. He gave his one and only son in our place. He deserves all the glory. He spoke words and the world came into being. He spoke and the planets and the stars, the sun and the moon and the waters and the plants and the animals as he spoke. And then he stopped and he got a little dirty. He got down and formed out of the dust of the earth. He formed us. He, he wanted something special. And he created us. You talk about we, he deserves our glory. And not only did he did he shape us and mold us, but then he breathed life into us. And he gives us this life. And he sent Jesus Christ so that we might have life. But not only life, but life more abundantly. We have so much to worship him for. And it says, ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. Now, do you have to be in a shirt and tie to be in holy array? No. Maybe you're not wearing a tie this morning. 
The other, no, holy, what the, the original, the original translation of this is talking not as much about what you're wearing, but in what you're doing, and how you're acting, and where it's coming from, that joy, and that newness, and that strength, and the Lord wants us to grab a hold of that as we worship him, because he is worthy. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The the God of glory thunders. How many of you this week during that thunder and lightning? What was that, Tuesday night? Wednesday? Was it just not where I was at? No. I hope to shout, man, oh man. I, I know I've got a solid house because it's still standing. I saw lightning and like right after the lightning, it wasn't just, oh, it was pow. And I mean, the house, the windows vibrated. God thunder. I mean, his voice thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Man, you talk about someone who deserves our praise. Father, this morning, help us to grab a hold of this. Father, I pray as water's edge, we will not be dull of hearing. And we will not be dull in our spirits. But Lord, that we will have a joy and an excitement and a strength knowing that we have a personal, one-on-one, -on -one, ongoing relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And we have the power of the Spirit as he has entered us and empowered us and blessed us and is walking with us. Lord, we have so much to be appreciative for. Help us, Father, to express that and to live that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Also, the woman at the well. Worship is giving God what is due him. The woman at the well, John 4, 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is, is from the Jew. But an hour is coming, and how many of you can say, how many of you that are not of Jewish descent this morning can say, Thank you, Lord, that an hour has come. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But an hour is coming and now is. I mean, Jesus is salvation standing explaining it to her. Wouldn't that be incredible? Yeah. When the true worshipers <clears throat> will worship the Father in spirit, from the depths of their being, and in truth, Amen. knowing that it is correct. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. That is an incredible statement there, that we need to worship him in spirit and in truth, and that God is searching, he's seeking for worshipers. And as I was talking this morning with the, the team as we were getting ready to pray, you know, we... We are blessed in the fact that Jesus sought us out. If we are saved, he's, he sought us out. And he, he, he paid for us, and, and he, he shed his blood for us, and, and he loved us. And if, if you're saved, that's the most incredible gift that you can receive is salvation. But on top of that, do you realize that from that group that is saved, God is looking in, searching for that group that is going to be his real worshipers. One day, as I said, one day we're going to be standing in the presence of God, worshiping him and glorifying him. And sadly, there are people here today, and I'm not going to pick out names and make eye contact, but some of you can't wait for worship to be over to get on with the service, and you're just going to be disappointed in heaven. Amen. Excuse me, straight up. Amen. Worship is what it's about. We are called to worship God. And right now, Dennis said, well, pastor, that's kind of like when you're a temp. 
I said, okay. <laughs> he said, well, you get, you, you get hired on as a temp, and you're trying to, to earn yourself into a position, so you're giving it your very best, so they see you really want to do this job. And you're looking around, finding what other things you can do. Hey, train me here. Teach me how to do that. He said, we're temps right now. Wanting to be hired for the full-time job of being the worshipers of God. Praise God. And this morning, we need to grab a hold of that fact. That's what eternity is all about. The question is, what motivates you to worship? Is it because you feel like worshiping? What motivates you to pray? Because the car just broke? What? Well, let me ask you this. What motivates you to go to work? Oh, well, that's different. Have to go to work. Don't have to worship. Don't have to pray. What? I worship because my cup is over. There you go. I mean, far too often we only worship when we feel like it. Let me ask you a question. If we only worship when we feel like it, is that valid worship? No. If we only pray when we feel like it, is that valid prayer? Let me ask you this. What would your lifestyle be like if you only went to work when you felt like it? <laughs> Let's be real. You might say, oh, Pastor, that's not a fair comparison. I think it really is. I think we need to recognize that this is our job. This is our calling. This is what we're meant to do. So how are we commanded to worship him? Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Thank <laughs> you. 
you're going to wash that thing, you're going to wax it, you're going to finally clean out the garage and park it in there. Yeah? <laughs> when a kid comes by it with a bicycle, you're going to dive between the car and the kid. You're going to put worth on that. Now, fast forward, you keep that car 10 years, it's got 189,000 miles on it. It may not go in the garage every night. When's the last time you washed that rascal? <laughs> Wax well, hasn't touched it for five years. You, de you determine what things are worth. People! We determine what people are worth. You've seen it. You walk in the door and someone that values you highly from across the room says, Hey, I'm glad you came. Somebody that's right next to you that doesn't turns and walks away. We determine worth and value every day in all our actions. And this morning, God is saying, what am I worth to you? As a matter of fact, in the Anglo-Saxon prayer book, where you find the marriage vows, the man states, with my body, I worship you. I thought that was weird. Worship, in the Anglo-Saxon prayer book, the man makes this vow and he says, with my body, I worship, or I you worship. Basically what he's saying is, in the way I give my body to you, it will be a distinctive commitment to you and to you only. For you alone are worthy of that relationship. That's pretty, that's, I think that brings it down to, to a point. That's what we're saying to God when we worship him. I'm giving, only you are worthy of what I am giving to you. And this is my sacrifice to you. You look at the, the woman that, that came in and different people were tossing things into the till and, and giving their offering. And this little widow lady came in and gave the light. And Jesus said, she gave more than anybody else. Not because of the amount that was given, but what it cost her to give it because it was all she had. And this morning, that's what God is asking. He's not, he's not asking for much, just everything you've got. That's worship. Revelation tells us that worship will be our eternal occupation. We need to understand that worship is what God has for us. And as I was putting this together, and I, I've known for several weeks that when we made this transition, I wanted to start into worship and stewardship and what God wanted to do in and through us. And uh, uh, I, I appreciate David covering Wednesday nights. I was able to get to our, our network conference up in Bowling Green. And uh, I was looking forward to going, got there, and, and our uh, our national superintendent, really the superintendent for the entire Assemblies of God around the world, George Woods, was there to speak. And I don't know about you, but, you know, if I don't know somebody, but everybody's making a big deal about them, I, I go with the idea, and I'll see. We'll see. And I walked in, you know, the guy, he gets to that point, he should have something in his, in his back pocket to bring out. But as he was preaching, he was telling about, he was, he was in a worship service. And they were, I mean, it was just blowing it up. He was loving it. Everything was going good. They were worshiping God together. And all of a sudden, they went to a song that just wasn't his cup of tea. Yeah, don't answer me. Don't tell me if it <laughs> just wasn't his cup of tea. And he thought, well, I could have done without that. And he stopped worshiping. And he said, he's standing there kind of thinking, boy, why did they pick this song? What that's done? Uh, and he looked over and he said, there was my grandson, both hands raised up, 20-some-year-old, just getting all over it with God. And he said, you know what? I need to be willing to give up my preference for someone else's passion. I need to be willing to give up my preference, what I prefer. Maybe you're here today and you prefer a quiet, sedate worship. Someone else's passion might be just to go after God with everything. And is your preference more valuable than their passion? The problem with that is many never find their passion due to submitting 
to the preference of others. We see that, I see that in marriages all the time. One spouse, this is what I want, this is how I like things, this is the way it's going to go, the other spouse, well then that must be the way it is, and they adopt that preference, and they never find their passion. Some never find their passion because they've adopted another's preference, believing it to be their own passion. This morning, let me ask you, maybe, maybe the way you worship is it's not your passion. Maybe it's your preference. Maybe God wants to go beyond your preference, into the passion of your heart, into what, what really is burning inside of you. So many people miss out in life. They take a job that's their preference and they miss out on the opportunity that's their passion. Some people, they'll make, they might take a job that's 9 to 5 they can clock in and clock out and be done. I tell you what, that's, that's one of the things that would be nice in ministry. I'm clocked out, sorry. I'm not thinking anymore. I'll, I'll be back Monday. <laughs> But if, I, if I'd have chosen that life as a preference, I would have missed my passion in ministry. And I wouldn't ever want to miss that. And this morning, are you living in preference or passion? And stop and think about it today. In this nation, people are passionate about very few things. I want you to listen to this found this says they, the survey by Porter Novelli conducted last summer found that 70% of Americans care deeply about a number of causes. 70% of Americans care deeply about a number of causes such as protecting the environment, fighting poverty, and improving schools. But of that 70%, less than 20% have done anything about what they're passionate about to better the causes in the past few years. In fact, on most issues, just one in 10 Americans has put time or effort toward improving the problems they care about. For example, 73% of Americans expressed concern about the environment, but just 10% had made an effort recently to help. 73% of people also said they care about improving schools and education, while only 17 had donated time to the cause in the past year. Even smaller percentages of America, Americans had volunteered to feed others. That's only 9%. 70% of people said, I have, I, I'm passionate about feeding the poor, but only less than 9% of them did anything about it. Those that wanted to assist the poor dropped down to 8%. Helping the homeless dropped down even to 7%. And my question this morning is, where's the passion? Those things that we say we're passionate about, if you're really passionate about something, you're going to do something about it. It's not just talking. We've got to get beyond lip service. And Jesus, Jesus even quoted the Old Testament prophet when he said, he said, my people worship me with lip service. They're honoring me with things that they've learned how to do from other people. It's not coming from their hearts. We've got to make sure that we are passionate. Where is our passion? Worship, let me tell you something. Worship is passion. If there is no passion in your worship, it's not worship. If there is no passion in your worship, it is not worship. The question is, do you enter into God's presence through passion or through preference? And are you willing to relinquish your preference for someone else's passions? So why do we worship? See, worship is an important part of our search for knowing more of God. And our search for life itself. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. It says, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first 
his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. How do you seek the kingdom of God? You worship him. How do you seek not only the kingdom of God, but his righteousness? You worship him. And as you, I tell you what, when you begin to truly worship God, things open up to you. The heavens open up as you worship God and you really pour yourself into glorifying him. I, 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 I probably told this story too many times, but i got to tell it right here. When I went to Russia for the first time, in, well, it's the only time, really. <laughs> but I, I, I fly over to Russia. I get there. I'm suffering. Jet, I had never flown before, and my first trip was to Russia. <laughs> I, I, had, I heard about jet lag. I had no clue. I was in La La Land. I get to Russia. I get there, and, and we're, we're in an area where in the summer the high is typically about 75 degrees. They're in a heat wave, and it's in the 90s. And they don't have screens in the windows, but that doesn't matter because the windows don't open. And it's hot. Oh, and by the way, you don't flush the toilet paper. You put it in a bucket in the bathroom. Did I mention the windows don't open? <laughs> oh, and by the way, we're at the camp that we were at with all the teenagers, about 400 Russian teenagers, the water main broke and we had no running water to flush the toilets. Or for the children to shower. Did I mention the windows didn't open? <laughs> and I remember walking to the cafeteria down the dusty path. And I was talking to God. I was telling these people, they don't understand what I say. I don't understand what they say. It is hot. I don't like it here. It smells. <laughs> and I don't know what that meat was that I ate for lunch. <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> but... I get to the first service, and Ty's not here today, but our, our, one of our drummers, but he was a teenager on that trip from Maslin, it was a trip from Ohio, and we got up on the platform, and I, I, wasn't, I was just supposed to be there as an adult helping, but the kid that played bass had just learned how to play bass, and he really didn't know, so they asked me to play, so I was playing bass, and we, we had the song service, and it was a good service. And we had, they did some silly skits, and the kids liked it, and that was good. And, and uh, then we, we had testimony time, and man, there was some, you know, good stuff. And then they dismissed us, and I left the platform to go down and realize every seat in the place is taken. i got to sit on that wall, against the wall on the floor. So I'm sitting there, and I'm still telling God, oh, I don't even get to sit on a seat, do I? <laughs> and Steve Hill, he was... If you know, Steve, he just passed away recently from cancer. He was down at the Brownsville Revival. Mm -hmm. But before that, he was with me in Russia. Wow. And he began preaching. I, as I'm sitting there along that wall, I look, over, look right in front of me, a beautiful young Russian girl, probably about 17, sitting there just weeping. And I, so I start, what do I do? I do the youth pastor thing. Lord, touch her. You don't, you, I don't speak her language. You do, Father, touch her. And Steve, he gets done. I'm thinking... He's going to have altar calls. She'll go down. We'll pray for her. Be a good time. Everything will be great. And he gets done. He said, we're not going to have an altar call. And I thought, what in the, what do you mean you're not going to have an altar call? And I started to God, he's not even having an altar call. I'm here. I, it's milk. <laughs> and then he called the, the piano player up and he began playing a song that I had never heard before. Kaktili. I've later found out that means how great thou art. Totally different rendition, totally different words. But he began playing. And I had, all of us were standing. He had called us to stand. I'm, I'm standing there and I close my eyes and I begin to, to listen and I hear something I've never, a worship that I have never heard in my life. I grew up in music. Music is my passion, if you haven't gathered. 
and I'm listening to the sound that I've never heard before, and I am in awe. To the point that I had to peek to look and see, and I really expected to see angels. And as I opened my eye and peeked, I recognized that without me hearing them or knowing it, they didn't draw any attention to themselves. All, these were theater seats that kind of spring up. All of them had climbed up and were standing on their seats. They were singing and they were waving their hands in a praise offering to the Lord. This is something that I don't think they had ever seen before. They just did it spontaneously. That was it. And as I saw that, I got a lump in my throat. And if you've ever heard of someone getting a lump in their throat, if it wasn't painful, it wasn't a lump. <laughs> I got this lump in my throat, and I thought, what in the world? It's painful. Lord, you've got, and I started praying, Lord, you've got to help me. And I thought, I've got to do something. It's, and it just kept getting more and more intense until I thought, I'm a musician. I don't care if I don't know the words. I'm going to sing just to do something to try and help this. And I opened my mouth and nothing would come out. And it got more intense. And I thought, Lord, I don't want to go to a hospital in Russia. <laughs> so I'll be being honest. That's, and, I began, and I thought, I'm going to worship God. And I opened my mouth and said, praise God. And nothing would come out. And it got more intense. And finally I said, Lord, whatever you want. And he broke me into pieces. He showed me things. He changed my life. He changed my ministry. And I want you to understand that finding your passion in worship will open up your understanding like you've never known before. God wants to work through our worship. Our worship is how we seek God. But what do we seek God with? Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Matthew 16, 24. And Tish, if you'll come to the piano. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We've got to search for him with all our hearts, and we've got to let go of our desires and our wants. And finally, Proverbs 23, 6. Do not eat the bread of a selfish man, or desire his delicacies. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. He says to you, eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. And the key part of that verse is the beginning of verse 7. For as a man thinks within himself, so he is. Our thoughts within, it can't be a non-involved worship. It cannot be a mouthing of words, a repetition. It needs to come from the depths of our heart. Worship is a matter of the heart. Romans chapter 10, verse 8 says, But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart. The heart, that's believing in your heart at the very core of your being, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. It's got to be deep down within our hearts. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us 
draw near with a sincere heart. Think about that. Man, when, when Moses was with God, he didn't get to see God's face. He only got to see behind him as he walked away. And then just the worship experience he had with God when he came down, the people said, Moses, cover your face. We can't take this. When the people wanted their sins forgiven, they had to bring offerings into a priest who then went into God with bells hanging on his, his robe and a rope tied around his ankle so that if he was struck dead, they could pull him out with the rope. They weren't allowed to go into the Holy of Holies because it was such a sacred place and man was unclean and unfit to go into the presence of God. But Jesus Christ gave his life, shed his blood, and made it possible for us to enter in. That's what it's saying there. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, how would you have liked to have been that high priest with the robe and the bell and the rope? <laughs> And you go through this long process of purification. You, you stay away from everything and anything. I mean, you pretty much lock yourself into a room and pray constantly. You fast. You seek the Lord. And then you're afraid to go to sleep because what you might dream. And then you walk up to that door thinking, oh, am I ready? And the guy ties the rope around your ankles and says, if we don't hear you jingling, we're going to give a tug and you need to jingle or we're going to, because I'm not, you know, the guy with the rope saying, I'm not going in there to get you. <laughs> they couldn't go into the presence of God. Someone else had to go in for them with fear and trembling. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great high priest, or great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart. Isn't that something that we owe him? In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our body washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, this is another part of we owe worship to God to lead others in worship. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Worship is our job. Worship is part of stewardship. My question this morning is, has your relationship with God or the lack thereof been molded by a misunderstanding of worship, what worship is really all about? Are you sitting here beginning to recognize that there is a hole in your salvation? That there is an important piece
don't even know God has a good sense of humor. Those Philistines, they, they took the ark and they set it up there for, in their temple. I believe it was Dagon. There are different, different situations where, I mean, they come in and they're all, they're, they're, their idol was falling over and falling over again, falling over his hands, broken off. My favorite one, though, is God struck him with him. I can imagine them strutting down. We got the ark of cousin. We got a bowl. <laughs> they sent it from town to town. We don't want it here. And it spread from town to town. Finally, they got, oh, we're sending it back. A whole story of how it came back and, and, and the fellas that touched it when they shouldn't have and the fellas dropped dead. And they left the ark there. And
that's you this morning, I want you to find a place at this altar. I want you to touch God and let his glory fill your life. Hallelujah.
never the same. Father, I speak that blessing upon each one under the sound of my voice. That they will be worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. Lord, those that you are looking for to have as your worshipers. Lord, we want to be your worship team. Father, now I pray that blessing of walking in the glory of the kingdom of God. Lord, in walking in your revelation of truth and joy and hope. And Father, as we worship you, as we draw closer to you, I thank you that as we seek for you, we will find you when we seek for you with all our hearts. Lord, I pray you will continually watch us, continually cause old things to pass away and continually cause all things to be new again. Lord, break the bondage of the past. Lord, the unforgiveness, I speak a release right now in Jesus' name. Yes. 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 Lord, those pet sins, I thank you, Lord, for a release in Jesus' name. Lord, those hidden things in our life, I speak the blessing that they are covered and washed away. Old things, Father. Thank you. The old things have passed away. And I speak newness in each life. Lord, as you pour out that blessing, we will be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory, because it's all about you. In the precious, matchless, wonderful. 